You're listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. Today on the show, new religious movements. Life, the Universe, and Everything Else explores the intersection of science and society. If you have questions or comments about the show, or you'd like to suggest a topic, you can find us on Twitter or Facebook, or send us an email at lueepodcast at winnipegskeptics.com. Show notes and references can be found at lueepodcast.com. I'm your host for this episode, Lauren Bailey. With me today, I have Ashlyn Noble. Hello. Laura Creek Newman. Hi there. And Jem Newman. Hi. New religions. What is a new religion? A religion that is less old. That is the exact definition. Purposefully nebulous, where all we know is that it is a religion that has been developed somewhere in the last, right, I think we're sitting in under 200 years. Yeah, that's, that's the definition that I had come across, somewhere developed in the 19th or 20th century, yeah. usually. So like a religion that we might have a photograph of the founder. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they still count um, Latter-day Saints. Yeah. as a new religion, mm-hmm. and that was founded in 1830. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we're, we're, we're approaching the bicentennial. <laughs> well, then we can kick Joseph Smith right off the list. <laughs> <laughs> just like the lynch mob Then did. they'll just become a regular religion. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that, there are different types of new religions. There's splinter groups, which are groups that splinter off from a more established religion. There are sects, which is sort of like a splinter group, but not quite... They have a slightly different philosophy that isn't as splintery as the splinter group, and they probably weren't formed with a fight, which is what splinter groups are probably formed as. Right. That's what I was thinking with that. A sect is probably a particular group that really hones in on a couple of ideas there, but considers themselves part of the larger group, where splinters, there's a division of some kind. Yeah. Think of Christianity, like the division of the Catholic Church with the Protestant movement, and then all the different groups from Mm -hmm. there that splintered off. They were all Mm -hmm. splinter movements and then became their own religious things. Henry VIII was definitely a splinter. (laughs) And before that, there were even all of the various, like the Ethiopian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox. I fell down so many rabbit holes. Besides splinter groups and sects, we have resurrections of old religions. So when somebody brings up the Norse pantheon and calls themselves the Astro, which is... A white supremacist movement. Don't get involved. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Or people worship the Greek gods or that kind of thing. That would be a resurrection of old religions. We're also looking at things like Wicca or new pagan movements. Hmm. So they wouldn't count as new religions, even though people haven't practiced them for like a very long time? It is a new religion, but it is based off of a resurrection of an old religion. And there are scholarly arguments about how much it is actually based on uh, old religions and how much it is just sort of influenced by the popular cultural conception. These are amorphous categories, and any sort of scholar of new religions will probably give you different categories based Mm -hmm. on what their particular thesis is about. Hmm. I've probably mentioned it on the show before, but my sort of catapult into atheism was studying Egyptian gods and realizing that even though nobody worshipped them anymore— nothing bad had happened, even though they were supposed to be like super wrathful and yada yada. (laughs) So I was kind of like, hmm, I I bet that's what's happening now. Like, Nobody worships them anymore. We're going to get into that. (laughs) (laughs) I was in sixth grade, okay? (laughs) I simplified it a little. They aren't popularly worshipped the way that current religious movements are. But the Nile hasn't dried up completely for a thousand years. (laughs) Wait, was Stargate on when you were in sixth grade? Had you seen Stargate? No, I didn't get into that until later. I mean, the movie. But I don't know. I didn't watch it then. <laughs> Stargate, I think, happened when I was in sixth grade. So it, yeah, it, it, it happened when I was in high school. It was big. What was that? Ninety six. Yeah, something like, something mm-hmm. like that. Something yeah. like that. Such a good show. We aren't going to look that up, listeners. So just deal. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good show. The show was in ninety six. No, but, but the movie was, was based good. off of the, it. the Kurt Russell one. It was I think right. That was Kurt Russell, right? That was Kurt Russell. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And James Spader. Oh, yeah. I had such a crush on young James Spader. Nobody's perfect. Not Blaine. James Spader. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So we've got splinter groups. We've got sex. We've got resurrections of old religions. We have new schools of thought, which people develop, and they can become new religions. So does that mean 
some philosophical theories that then become sort of worshipped? What, what does new school of thought mean exactly in a blob amorphous definition? <laughs> Cults that stood the test of time. Okay. Okay. We're going to get into the difference between a religion and a cult in a oh, little bit. Oh, excellent. Yeah. But anybody who comes up with a new idea that is then treated as a religion or some sort of worshipping and gathering group. Ah, uh, okay. After new schools of thought, we have parody religions that became real and parody religions that stay parody. <laughs> Let's look at the difference between a religion and a cult. What is the difference? Well, there's two schools of thought on that, Laura. Ooh, more schools of thought. I'm very excited. <laughs> First school of thought, time. Ah, yes. Second school of thought, a cult has a charismatic personality at the head. Love bombing, which is inviting new members by loving them up and either flirty fishing and offering them sex or just saying, you're wonderful and we can give you everything your family never has. There's isolation of parishioners which is a big part of cults, take them away from the outside world. Then there becomes abuse of parishioners. And really the worship is the almighty dollar. So how does this differ from regular religions exactly? You're not usually isolating your parishioners. Depending on your religion, like um, with Muhammad or Buddha or what's his name? Jesus? <laughs> that guy. Um, <laughs> a bit of a charismatic, but he's not somebody in the actual living memory of people who are in the, the religion. The person has become a mythical figure. Right. Yeah, and, and unlike, um, you know, L. Ron Hubbard to David Miscavige, uh, where you keep the, oh, I mean, Miscavige doesn't have that much charisma, but you, you keep the charismatic leader, abusive leader aspect in, uh, you know, religions, less cults, uh, you, you, th that kind of falls away. Right. Somewhat. And <laughs> usually with a cult, if we're going to use Scientology as our baseline, because that was what it was when I was thinking of these, yeah. um, there's no changing to the message allowed. And it's one organization. Like, it's not like you can't say, oh, you're a Catholic. All the other Catholics do the same thing that you do. All the Scientologists sure. do the same thing. I do see that. I think then that the it sounds like the biggest factor really is time because none of us were there at the beginning of these different things. And the only way you really get a groundswell movement is by getting everybody to toe the same line behind a really charismatic leader. But you also have personal abuse and isolation and a bigger focus on money as much as, you know, don't look at the Catholic Church. Well, and the see, see, this is kind of what I'm thinking. Because yeah. I'm like, okay, well, those latter two things definitely happen. So... <laughs> yeah, Catholic Church uh, is ticking a lot of boxes here. That's but that, yeah. it's not baked into the theology. Yeah. Right, yes. That's, okay. that's where I'm there, going. That, okay. I like that. I like that. It's not baked into the theology. Right. Yeah. Speaking of David Miscavige, he is going to be deposed on March 24th. What? Oh, really? oh, yeah. Check out The Underground Bunker at TonyOrtego.com for more information. <laughs> oh, Ortega's still going, eh? Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. Every day. I read them every day. <laughs> wow. Why do people join a religion? I've been thinking this to myself for the last few years as I've gotten more involved in Unitarian Universalism myself, which is considered a new religious movement because it was combining two previously existing uh, religious movements. <laughs> two great tastes that taste great together. <laughs> I joined the religious movement that I'm a member of because I wanted to feel a sense of community. Mm -hmm. And you're finding more people in our age group, so the under 50s, who are joining newer religious movements because they have a more free doctrine, but they still offer the same uh, feelings of good, good fellowship and connection with people in your community. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're seeing there's over 10,000 new religious movements worldwide, mostly in Asia and Africa. And you're finding people who are looking for connection, even in our digital world. You're look, still looking for that human connection. That makes a lot of sense. And these would be people who may have been raised without it or, you know, left it early on or something yeah. like that. But they're reaching that point in their life where I need something additional to myself. Yep. The and world doesn't revolve around me. For me, that was age 35. I was like, I need something to have a bit more meaning in my life. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things that I I 
not that I was heavily involved at church, but I, I do miss that part of it there. I did a lot of music there and I got to know some people through that and just having some of those types of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Becoming involved. We all still need to just reach out to each other. Don't reach out right now. Elbow bump. (laughs) (laughs) Social distancing, everybody. Yes. So it's interesting that most of those movements are not in North America. I would have expected more of them to be in North America for some reason. North America follows a very codified, for the lack of better term, Western religion. One of the three Abrahamic religions is probably going to be your jumping off point. Okay. So you'll see more sects oh, okay. and, and splintering from those religions. But if you get into something like Taoism or um, Buddhism or whatever, you might be looking for something a bit more charismatic. Right. Okay. Interesting. Before I was a UU, I identified as a Discordian. Has anyone heard of Discordia? No. Where is Discord? Only because of you. The worship and the philosophy of Discordianism is life is chaos, enjoy it. There are two entities to the universe. There's Eris, who was the Greek goddess of discord and creation, and Aneris, who was her sister, the Greek goddess of destruction and uh, keeping things the same. So you got your light side of the force and your dark side of the force. Oh, okay. Discordianism and the Church of the Subgenius are often grouped together when discussing new... Uh, religious movements that are that do not take themselves too seriously. Yeah. But they are not the same. The main thing for Discordianism is everything is chaos. Embrace it. You're a pope. <laughs> oh, okay. That came out of nowhere. Right. The base level of any human being on earth is a pope. Just, just a pope. Okay. You're a pope. And, and what, what do you do from there? Whatever you want. Okay. But quite honestly, I can see that kind of, but it sounds exhausting. Discordianism is based on, I think there's like multiple numbers of sacred texts, not all of which are actually real or all of which which are actually written. (laughs) Are they on somebody's to-do list or something? No, they just exist as titles or things to reference. It also has its own calendar. (laughs) Oh, God. Which I didn't write down any references to, but it's five-day weeks and five-month sets. I think Prickle is one of them. I can't remember. How are the religious holidays? There are four base religious holidays a year, but you can turn any day into a holiday that you want. The calendar does match up with the uh, Gregorian calendar. I mean, I guess you are a pope, so yeah. you so need to just declare a holiday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if the world is nothing but chaos, then why can't it be a holiday every yeah. day? Part of the religious activism in Discordianism is called Let's Fuck Everything Up. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. You ask. It's okay. good. Okay. It's like, they're the ones who created Towel Day for Douglas Adams' birthday. Mm. And there's one day, I think it's like Justin Day or something, where, I'm sorry, I should have written all of this down. (laughs) Doesn't matter what you call it, because it's chaos. Where you are to send letters to your politicians that detail what you don't like about what they're doing. Oh yeah, so Justin Day. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it started long before, probably more in the um, Pierre era. But you are... I don't like your son. <laughs> but you he will are... be a bad prime minister one day. <laughs> hey, if they could predict that, they would have way more followers. Right. Yeah. 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 But you are encouraged to sow responsible chaos and take care of the world around you. And that's what appealed to me. Hmm. And that's why, even though I'm a, a UU as well, I'm also a Discordian. I enjoy chaos, except when I have to clean it up. Uh-huh. <laughs> Is there... How does organization work with that at all? It sounds like it it could be just a group of individuals coming at it very individually, but then you would need some kind of uh, cooperation to create these types of things. Are you sure? I don't know. (laughs) You're you're assuming that they do create these types of things. I mean... (laughs) Well, they like they create Towel Day and like that. Well, that's, that's what I'm referencing. Like Towel Day is a thing that I wouldn't know about if it were not for you, but it's a thing that apparently a lot of people know about. Mm-hmm. So you generally need some organization to support the creation of said thing. Like, not necessarily. No, I mean they New, they, they were big on news groups at the beginning of the internet. It's you know grassroots organizing basically. Yeah, a bunch of people just agree that they want this thing and. Yeah. Yeah, that's all, that's all I'm really asking. Yeah. When did this movement start? In the 60s. Oh, okay. So it wasn't like Facebook groups started it. No. 
No, this has been around for a while. And I mean, it's still a new religion, but... I bet it started at an orgy. There might have been. I don't know. <laughs> In the 60s, new religion. <laughs> All goes together. There are groups that get together and plan things for their own local area, but you can be a Discordian without having a group. Right. I've never had a group. I've run into things online and said, that sounds cool. I think I'll pick it up too. Okay. Or I've run into like reading some sort of tract that somebody left somewhere saying, you know, destroy this. And I'm great. <laughs> okay. No, I, I was just curious mm-hmm. how it works. Yeah. That's all. There's a whole thing with hot dogs too. You don't have to worry about. Oh, but you know how much I love hot dogs. What's the deal with hot dogs? <laughs> I need to know about the hot dog related things. On, on one of the holidays, you're to eat a hot dog bun. Just a bun. Just a bun. Okay. Maybe. Kira would be into this. She yeah. would totally. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's the worst part of the hot dog. In the spirit of Discordianism, I'm only going off of my memories of everything I've learned about Discordianism. I didn't go back and reread it. <laughs> reread anything today. <laughs> oh, the true Discordians would be proud. <laughs> That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> That's funny. But I'm assuming the rest of you are... I just want to know if there's one holiday that only involves eating the bun. Is there another holiday that only involves eating the wheat? Right, right, right. <laughs> you want to make one up? <laughs> no, I want to know if this is a thing that they have logically concluded must exist. <laughs> I'm sure someone somewhere has. All right. We can celebrate it. What day do you want to celebrate? And then though? another day you just have to eat the condiments. Yeah. Oh. That, would be, that would be an unpleasant day. Yeah. Because it's the culmination of all the things that make it really good. Uh, yes. Yeah. Which is why you should not eat a bun by itself. <laughs> what, what day of the year would you like to just eat a weenie? August 15th. My birthday? Yes. <laughs> it's the first day that came Hot Dog Sands Bun Day. <laughs> we can call it the Napoleonic Weenie Roast because it was also Napoleon's birthday. There you go. He also invented his own calendar. Yep, that sounds about right. What a religion, though. Did he invent a religion? Yes. <laughs> no. He made his brother an emperor. That counts as religion. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I would disagree with that. I mean, not necessarily. I don't know. It could be new religious movement. Could be chaos. There's plenty of people who worshipped him. New political movement, maybe. Yeah. How mu- how much does it take to turn a political movement into a religious movement? This is what I was just going to say. <laughs> the line between these things has always been blurred. The line got a little thicker for a while, and now it's getting quite blurred again. Mm-hmm. So that's a good question. And one we don't have time for tonight. Nope, not tonight. Because unlike the Discordian at the table... We have three people who have prepared segments. (laughs) (laughs) Two. (laughs) (laughs) Two and someone who's presently Googling. (laughs) No, I'm just joking. I'm good. Merely through happenstance, we have all picked different types of new religions based on my amorphous categories above. Laura is going to talk first about the Unification Church. Laura? Thanks, Lauren. Unification Day. Always find yourselves in an alliance-friendly bar on you day? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the Unification Church, or sometimes called the Unification Movement. Or some of you might know this as the 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 Moonies. Oh, yeah. And so (laughs) I couldn't remember the actual name of the church when I started Googling, so I just Googled (laughs) Moonies and it finally came up. And they're called the Moonies after the church's founder, Sun Young Moon. So he is originally from North Korea, but spent a lot of time in South Korea. And uh, he founded the church in 1954. And he led the church up until his death in 2012. And now his wife, Haksha Han, is the official leader of the church. Just to check my memory, is this the church that does, like, the enormous mass weddings? Yes. So that, the mass weddings are the thing that most people know about this church. I know them from airports. (laughs) (laughs) So they do a lot of recruitment. That's been a big part of the strategy. So the church started in Korea in 1954, and it grew quite rapidly within that decade. It had spread to Japan and parts of Europe, and in the 60s, it was into North America. It's now... I believe it's in a hundred different countries. I believe that. Membership numbers are, some will say that it is presently in the hundreds of thousands. Some will say it's only in the tens of thousands. Now it is varied. Um, At its height, it was probably in the hundreds of thousands. 
But they would also count membership in ways like anybody who's ever taken a free mint from one of their Mm. bowls is a member. Anybody who's ever like honked for one of their signs or something like that is a member. There's also... It's very Scientology. (laughs) Yeah. There's also some aspects like you can atone for sins for dead people in your family. Mm. So then making them... Yeah. yeah, Making them members. Baptism for the dead. Mm -hmm. So... It's really unclear how many people are members at present. How now. many living, actual humans go that, to their services that and whatnot. choose yeah. this there. <laughs> yeah, that's hard to know there. So what is the unification movement? Most people will describe it as a combination of Christianity, more of the Protestant background Christian movements, as well as a lot of the Eastern religious movements there from that area of the world. So it combines a lot of elements of that. We can't talk about the Unification Church without talking about its founder, because he's a central part of this church. Um, Or is it a cult then? (laughs) Well, and that's a good question around it. Sun Myung Moon was born to a Confucian family that converted to Presbyterianism. So he spent most of his young years uh, in the Presbyterian Church or variations of that in Korea, apparently was quite engaged with the church and that. And it was in his late, uh, late teens, early adulthood that he started coming up with some religious ideas of his own and that, and ultimately that led to him being excommunicated from the church because of some of this. At the same time, he was running into problems with politics and governments. So, of course, he lived through the Second World War, the Japanese occupation, all of these kinds of things, and also through the division of the Koreas. So he was originally from North Korea. Growing up there, he was arrested for practicing capitalism, as they Mm -hmm. called it, and jailed. And so he fled to South Korea for that as well. And that was around the same time that he got kicked out of the the church. Just rebelling on all scales, isn't he? Right. What the the basis of this church is, is like I said, it's built off a lot of the Christian ideals or or the Christian background. But Sun Myung Moon claims that Jesus visited him in visions and gave him more information, enough to write an additional divine book called The Divine Principle. So it's very similar to Mormonism in that way and that they accept Christian scripture and all of that, but they also have The Divine Principle authored by Sun Myung Moon with the influence of Jesus. He's just Jesus' ghostwriter. It's a little less like that, actually. And more like Jesus is his ghostwriter? Yeah, well, sort of. It's like Jesus told him, you're special. Go and write down your ideas about a religion and make a religion. And so he went and did that and made it a governing book of this religion. It's funny how often Jesus does that to people. Yeah, yeah. Always like young men in a lot of ways. He's a very supportive guy, that Jesus. You know, you do you. (laughs) Right. And he was a dude. Build you up. He was a dude who only made it to like 33, so of course he's just going to gravitate to his own kind. And that's interesting that you mentioned that he only made it to like 33 because that's a really important part of the tenets of this religion here. <laughs> So much like a lot of the Christian type religions, it's built on the belief of creation and the fall of man and then the eventual reinstatement of man to his God and a pure love and everyone is pure and perfect and happy and and all that kind of thing. So that's where we're at right now, trying to reinstate ourselves to God's state. So God is a little bit different in the unification church. God is, of course, this supreme being, but Because he's so pure and humans are not, he sort of personifies himself so that he can be at our level there. But the goal is to get us back up to that level. He personify himself as Reverend Moon? Yes. (laughs) But I'll get to that. Should I not have asked that question? We can cut that out. (laughs) No, that, that is just fine. There's a few ways that we can restore ourselves to this pure vision of what God thought we should be. One of the ways is a process called indemnity. So this is where you can gain salvation through good deeds and acts of kindness. And this is where you can do that for people who are dead as well. So you can sort of save your family members, very much like Latter-day Saints kinds of baptisms and that. And then there's the idea of marriage is also a really important part. Having perfect, pure marriages is a really important part of restoring humanity. So this is where Jesus dying too early comes in. Because, according to the Unification Church, the way that Jesus was going to restore man was by having this perfect, pure marriage. But he died too early, so he couldn't do that and then have perfect, pure children. Through Jesus' apparitions to Sung Young Moon, Jesus said there is going to be a third Adam. So the first Adam was 
Adam of Adam and Eve. The second Adam was Jesus, because he was going to be the next father of humanity. And then the third Adam will be a man born in Korea between 1917 and 1930, who will become the third Adam and save all of humanity. I'd like to point out and he's some- also he's also incredibly handsome. <laughs> And everybody <laughs> likes him, and he has lots of friends. Exactly. I need to point out here that Sun Gun Moon is Korean and was born in 1920. So... <gasps> yes. <laughs> what are the chances? <laughs> what are the chances? So as we can all tell, yes, he named himself the next Messiah. Woo! And called himself the true father. So the people who follow the religion are called uh, the true children um, and the true family and like that. And there. the rest of us are fakers. Right. So ultimately the goal of the church is to unify all of humanity under one pure and loving belief system to be one with God. And this would be the unification system under Sun and Moon. So yeah, he wants... 7 billion people to worship him, essentially. I'm Good sold. <laughs> Radically different takes on this here. <laughs> so some other things that are important to know about this church. It is built off of some of the most conservative elements of the Christian church. So it is very much akin to a lot of the Christian right that we would see here. And in fact, Sun Myung Moon was really close with a lot of the Christian right leaders here. He donated money to Liberty University oh. and Jerry Falwell uh, actually spoke on his behalf at his tax evasion hearings, I think, <laughs> uh, for which he did serve 13 months in prison here in the U.S. So the, the Unification Church, very conservative, very nuclear family focused, very much the man is the leader and the, and the wife bears the children and cares for the children and follows the man, that kind of thing there. Uh, very anti-same-sex marriage, all of that kind of stuff. And one of the biggest things, <laughs> there's a lot of fist bumps going on in here. Um, he's not into that kind of plural marriage, okay? He's not into plural marriage <laughs> no, at no, all. No, it's I'm, not into that, although he was, was definitely tough. into having mistresses and <laughs> not telling his followers. It's some were children. <laughs> that was my well, attempt at referencing the, the mass weddings. Oh, the, the okay. The joke didn't plural quite come marriage. together. Yeah. Like, Multiple. Plural marriages. <laughs> <laughs> It's important to know that his wife was only 17 when they got married, and he was 40. Ugh. Yeah. It makes sense how she's still running the thing, then. Well, that and, you know, being beaten down and, and brainwashed and stuff like that. I don't know. It's, it's not good. It wasn't good. If you read some, of, uh, read some of the show notes, it doesn't sound like it was a good time for her <laughs> and, and that. So marriage is a big part of the church as well. And so they hold these mass marriages as a way to, because it's so important, marriage and that family is so, so important there. They hold these big displays as, as a way to show God their love and, and things like that. So not everybody at these mass marriages is getting married for the first time. Yeah. A lot of people will go and they'll have blessings. And so they just reaffirm their commitment to their marriage and to the church. They're renewing their vows. Yeah. But a lot of people are getting married. What's interesting, though, is that it's usually arranged marriages. Mm. Many of the people have never met their spouse. They'll often be from different countries. They might not even speak the same language. Yes. And they're personally arranged, or they were, by Sun Myung Moon himself. Apparently, they would get photographs of people and short bios and just say, these two people seem like they would be good. And then you go and you get married, and now you are married to someone you've never met. Matchmaker, matchmaker. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> I'm assuming their stance on children is very akin to Quiverful, is it? Very pro-baby. It is very pro-baby. Like, it's very pro-family. As um, many babies as possible? That's the quiverful. I don't form. know that it was as many babies as possible, but I'm pretty certain the stance would be you don't do things to stop babies from happening there. But I don't think it's actively go out and try to fill up the world. Okay. I don't get that sense. He and his wife had, I think, 13 children in total. So again, there, there's going to be some large families in there, but I don't get the sense that every family was 10 children or that okay. that was the goal of things. I'm not sure, but I think things like sort of rhythm method, like natural family planning would probably be okay. Anyway, very family oriented, 
But the idea of purity before marriage and abstinence before marriage is really, really, really important with this church as well. A couple other things to note. Uh, the church has always had a very strong pro-Korean stance. It is for the unification of the Koreas. Uh, but there's also some uh, reports that it worked as a bit of a, what's the word? Subversive. No, basically the Korean spy agency was working with them to get intelligence and, and to push Korean agenda in foreign countries and things like that there. So, you know. So Trump's a member. Something like that. It used to be more of an esoteric religion. So early on, you had to get quite far in before you really found out a lot of these kinds of things or got invited to all the ceremonies and that. But somewhere around the late 90s, it uh, started to be made a lot more public. It was around this time, too, that they were trying to push a little bit more politically and they wanted to push against the cult idea. So the church grew exponentially. Like I said, it started in the 50s and within a couple decades, it had thousands and thousands of followers. In the U.S. here, it would hold rallies of 25,000 people throughout the country. So it was drawing good-sized crowds. Mm -hmm. Most of the people still came from Korea, but like I said, it grew rapidly. And where they tended to find a lot of their people from was in the 1960s and 70s, they were getting, again, young people, like you said, but it was people who were not interested in sort of the drug and party culture. Yeah. So they wanted that connection, that community, that new movement, but they didn't want to be doing drugs all the time. And so that's where they really tapped into it. That's kind of how they built their base. And so there are a fair number of families that converted or, or got married in the church and then raised their children in that church, who then some of them got married in the 2000s in mm -hmm. the church as well. So less orgies in this new religion. Many fewer, <laughs> many fewer orgies. But like I said, Sun Myung Moon wasn't opposed to some of these things there. So apparently he had a love child early on in his relationship with his current wife or with uh, Haksha Han. One of his children also had that and had multiple partners and things like that. So it's different for God. Yeah. There's a lot of that. There's some reports that the whole thing started off as a bit of a sex cult, but that's something that I don't know necessarily. So the current state of the church, like I said, its charismatic leader died in 2012. And it was at that point that they really found that the Unification Church really was a cult of personality there. And, and when you look at him and how he ordained himself like king of the world, basically, and he wanted everyone to follow him in his way, it makes total sense. So without that leader, it, the church has really lost a lot of followers. It's lost a lot of momentum. Officially, his wife now runs the church, but several of his children have started splinter organizations. Uh -oh. And I need to point out one of them. Their son, Sean, runs something called the World Peace and Unification Sanctuary. Very similar. If you look at sort of the, the dress that they wear and the types of ceremonies, super similar. Except that this group um, adds the delightful touch of encouraging its members to bring semi-automatic weapons to the mass blessings oh, that and church guy. ceremonies. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's all about, uh, you know, you, you should have a, like an AK-47 with you and, at all times, and that's going to keep the world safer and bring us together in harmony. And so that's, that's great. So Gunyang Moon. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> that's terrible. So Ashlyn missed it. <laughs> what did I miss? Gunyang Moon. No, I heard that. It okay. wasn't funny. Whoa. <laughs> divorce, divorce. <laughs> Sun Young Moon would frown upon that. Yeah. I assume divorces aren't allowed. They happen, but okay. they, they are frowned upon. Like, And again, because it's very much that once you are husband and wife, you each have your role and yeah. family is central and marriage staying in, like having marriage is central. So I wouldn't say it's not allowed, but it's frowned upon yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so it, it this religion really does seem to have lost its momentum and probably won't regain it um, because there's been a lot of scandals in the family and, and that as well. But uh, some guy decided that he was the second coming of Christ and got a lot of people to follow him and like that. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention. This church is really rich. 
like Mm -hmm. a lot of the successful religions. Not only did they get a lot of followers, but they were really successful at their fundraising. And then they created or bought into a bunch of different companies. So there's still a conglomerate around that is worth a lot of money that supported the church as well. I remember in the 90s, the oh my God, some of our company is owned by the Moonies. There was a whole big scandal. Yeah, so they actually, they owned a a newspaper for a long time, the Mm -hmm. Washington Times, I think. And uh, they own a a chunk of a bunch of other bunch mm-hmm. of other things now that company still exists so that's how it's been funding itself for a long time they owned some of disney i believe don't Could quote be. me on that but the company's called tongil so if ever you see the tongil conglomerate that's the moonies yeah there we go very cool well not really but excellent excellent <laughs> look at the moonies i mean you gotta head to the guy there's a lot of people who claim to be the second coming of christ and most of them don't get anywhere with it right <laughs> Some of us just start podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is kind of amazing what he accomplished in his life. Not good, just amazing. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, thanks. Let's continue this party with Jem. We're talking about the cult of Keck. <laughs> so uh, content warning time, uh, because this is my segment. And <laughs> as such, it gets a little grim. That's why we put him in the middle. Everybody get your comfort pillows or comfort objects out, and you're going to need them. Uh, in particular, there's discussion of both white supremacy and anti-Semitism. I will just get this out of the way up front. This is not a real religion. It's one of those so-called parody religions, like Pastafarianism, or Dudism, or Scientology. <laughs> but it's also one worth talking about. Uh, I'll get to why in just a minute. Uh, if that content warning did not give it away. But first, what do you know about Pepe the Frog? It is a cartoon ugly frog who has been co-opted by the right uh, as sort of a mascot, and the author or creator of this frog is very upset that it has been co-opted in such a manner. Yeah. It is the best lapel pin to wear if you want to get punched in the face. (laughs) Absolutely. We'll get into all of this. So uh, for those listeners who are unfamiliar, Ashlyn summarized it very well. Um, (laughs) Yay. Pepe is a crudely drawn anthropomorphic frog. Though the original was in black and white, today he's usually green with brown lips. And he's weirdly lumpy and bulgy in that way that just screams, I belong on an image board. (laughs) Today, Pepe is closely associated with the alt-right, specifically the loose collection of authoritarian white supremacist losers that happen to be extremely online, congregating on 4chan and Twitter and Gab, a Mastodon instance that's basically Twitter but without the pretense of caring about having Nazis on their platform. They've deplatformed me. I have to go to Mastodon. Pepe's association with white nationalism is so strong that he's been listed as a hate symbol by the Anti-Defamation League since 2016. Mm. Hmm. The 2016 video of white supremacist Richard Spencer getting punched in the face was taken just as he was opening his mouth to explain the Pepe pin on his jacket. (laughs) (laughs) I can watch that over and over and over. It's really good set to music. (laughs) So with all this in mind, it may come as a surprise to some, uh, though not those who are listening to Ashland's explanation a moment ago, that uh, Pepe's origin was comparatively benign. His first appearance was in the first issue of Matt Fury's Boys Club comic, uh, which Fury posted to his MySpace page way back in the days of yore in 2005. Aw, MySpace. (laughs) R.I.P. Tom. In Boys Club, Pepe was uh, pictured urinating. Uh, accompanied by a speech balloon that read, Feels good, man. <laughs> so he was Bart Simpson. Get it? Yeah. Pepe? PP? Yeah. The internet sucks. Pepe quickly spread to 4chan, oh. where users created their own images of Pepe to fit any given scenario, adapting his expression and catchphrase as needed. The meme bled from 4chan into the wider web, and despite 4chan's monstrous politics, it wasn't seen as overtly political in and of itself. Hell, when I started my current job, whenever a new build would fail, a message would be posted to an internal Slack channel with a picture of sad Pepe. But that all changed in October 2015. Not that Slack channel, but uh, the public perception of Pepe changed in 2015 when then-presidential hopeful Donald Trump tweeted an image of himself as Pepe, 
In the lead up to the 2016 election, Pepe became closely associated with Donald Trump and his supporters. But wait, aren't we wildly off track? Why are we talking about a frog? Isn't this supposed to be about the cult of Keck? What the hell is a Keck? What anyone? is a Keck? Does anyone know? So the only thing that I know about Keck is that it is what happens when you mistype LOL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah. So presumably you're all familiar with LOL, LOL. In early internet chat lingo, LOL stood for laugh out loud or laughing out loud. <laughs> God. Lots of love at the end of the email from your mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I was thinking K-I-K. This is K-E-K, right? Yeah. Because yeah. well, K-I-K is what happens if you mistype lol. So, yeah. <laughs> but there is, a, there is a connection here. Oh, damn. So. <laughs> <laughs> right uh, for the wrong reason. <laughs> there is literally no way to explain internet slang to people without sounding so old. <laughs> this is where you insert the old ICQ, uh-oh, noise. <laughs> Incidentally, um, ICQ, now, I believe, owned by a Russian company and doing a lot of spying for Russian intelligence. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, no. um, the internet is awful, and it was a mistake. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Keck, spelled K-E-K for our listeners to this audio podcast, uh, is essentially the same as LOL. Uh, its origin is uncertain, but we know it's basically one of two things, or maybe two of two things. Um, it may have evolved from L-E-L, which is essentially a variant of L-O-L, um, but an alternative explanation is that Kek is a shortened form of ke 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 which is one of many Korean onomatopoeias for laughter. Mm. Uh, and this is certainly possible. Uh, as with English, ha-ha-ha is like the most common Korean onomatopoeia for laughter, but there are many variations. We have a few in English, but uh, in Korean, there are lots and lots of different variations for uh, laughter onomatopoeias that are mm. common in Korean comics that all have different uh, connotations. Right. Like, he 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 is very different from ha ha ha. Exactly. Right. And ke 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 is how uh, giggles are often written. I will offer a third origin story that I have heard. It is the 4chan kek cake with C-A-E-K for cake, also got bastardized into keck. Yeah, um, image boards and, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into a discussion of like leech speak, etc. Oh. and the intentional misspellings. Uh, it's all exhausting. I apologize for my early 20s. <laughs> <laughs> like Pepe, keck has transcended its innocuous origins to become something of an edgelord shibboleth. <laughs> Boy, probably, uh, probably not a good idea to use a Hebrew word to describe something even <laughs> tangentially related to Nazis, huh? Oh, mm, that was a mistake. Much like the internet itself. Um, <laughs> so sometime around 2016, an Anon on 4chan noted the similarity between Pepe the Frog and an Egyptian god of darkness, sometimes depicted with a frog's head. The deity's name? Kek. Anons immediately began posting memes of a deified Pepe birthing the Cult of Keck, a parody religion claiming to worship Pepe the Frog as the chaotic god of memes, a harbinger of destruction. So, this seems pretty goofy on the surface, right? Like, wh why is this even worth talking about? The Anons on 4chan obviously don't really worship Keck or Pepe or Kermit or whatever the hell that damn frog's name is. But one of the weird things about a lot of these memes is that they tend to use a lot of Hindu iconography. Yep. Now, why would that be? Uh, I mean, perhaps. <laughs> charitably? Charitably? No. <laughs> no. Charitably. These Anons are simply confused and or racist enough to conflate Hinduism with ancient Egyptian mythology. However, another strange thing about the cult of Kek is that it goes by another name. Esoteric Kekism. Esoteric religions defy easy definition, but they generally share the view that all religious traditions have a common origin and carry with them a, a hidden seed of truth that can be deciphered with careful study. And many have hidden doctrines that are not uh, well known among rank and file members, but are known among the elites in the religion. Esoteric traditions tend to be cobbled together, collecting and incorporating rejected knowledge, that is to say, ideas that have been rejected by both prevailing religious authorities and mainstream science. So, the cult of Keck, or esoteric Keckism, is truly 
in a lot of ways, an esoteric religion, because there is, in fact, a hidden doctrine and a hidden origin. There is one esoteric religion in particular that esoteric Kekism harkens back to, and that is the one founded by Savitri Devi. Though you might guess from her name that she was Indian, Devi was born in France to parents of Greek, Italian, and English ancestry, who named her Maximiani Portas. After moving to India, Devi became an influential voice in Hindu nationalism, proposing a synthesis of Hinduism and Nazism that has become known as esoteric Hitlerism. She claimed that Adolf Hitler was an avatar of Vishnu, who had been sent by Providence to end the Kali Yuga, the era of strife brought upon the world by the Jews. Once described as the missionary of Aryan paganism, she was one of the founding members of the World Union of National Socialists, and though she died in 1982, her beliefs remain hugely influential in far-right politics in India, uh, especially now with the resurgence of Hindu nationalism, and also with white supremacists worldwide. The name Esoteric Kekism is itself a sly reference to Savitri Devi's esoteric Hitlerism, explaining the Hindu imagery prevalent in many of the memes. An article in the International Business Times explicitly links esoteric Kekism to Devi's work, describing it as, quote, a bizarre amalgam of far-right imagery, Hindu iconography, and alt-right web slang. This is a common theme in online reactionary spaces. The flag of Kekistan, the fictional country to which many Anons claim to belong, is deliberately modeled after the war flag of the Nazi armed forces. Mm. I don't know, if you, have you ever seen these side by side? No, I've neither, no. I'll, uh, I'll pull them up. First on its own. Mm. That's Kekistan, I assume? That's Kekistan. Okay. And now, side by side. Yep. I've seen it. Mm hmm, mm hmm. Oh, yeah. As soon as I saw the keg, I'm like, I've seen this picture before. Now, if you've ever tried to push back against this kind of stuff online, you've invariably been told, what are you talking about? We're just being ironic. It's just all a bunch of goofs. Ironic racism comes from the same lineage as the disingenuous just asking questions tactic uh, so common in skeptic spaces. Someone who is just asking questions has a free pass to spout racist dog whistles without having to actually defend anything. Hey, I read somewhere that this particular identifiable group scores much lower on IQ tests. Why do you think that is? Or what do you think about that? This allows someone to spout racist talking points, but have an easy defense if called on it. Hey man, this isn't me talking, this is just something I heard and I was curious. What, we shouldn't ask questions anymore? No. <laughs> on the other hand, if the person they're talking to isn't familiar with the talking point and doesn't have a ready response, it's a win for racism. It's racism that doesn't even have the courage of its convictions. Uh, quick aside on the subject of IQ, IQ is hogwash. Uh, I'll take this opportunity to once again plug Sean's excellent takedown video of the bell curve. Ironic racism is a similarly cowardly tactic. In spaces with a small number of white supremacists, racist or sexist jokes function as a trial balloon to help identify fellow racists while providing plausible deniability. Come on, man, these are just jokes. No one really believes that George Soros is a literal octopus controlling world leaders like puppets. <laughs> <laughs> but this goes beyond bad jokes. The things people joke about are a window into what they really believe and the parody masks serious references to the work of Savitri Devi and other uh, white supremacists. Quoting again from the International Business Times, At an event in Washington, D.C. in November held following the election of Donald Trump, alt-right ideologue Richard Spencer, this is uh, once again the white supremacist who got punched while explaining his Pepe Le Pen pin, exhorted followers to hail Trump and proclaimed white people the children of the sun, a reference to Devi's 1958 work, The Lightning and the Sun, in which she describes people with sun qualities who transcend the process of historical decay. So that's pretty much it. That is esoteric Kekism. Uh, it is uh, basically a jokey way to be a Nazi, uh, like many things on 4chan. Incidentally, uh, as uh, alluded to earlier, Matt Fury, the artist who created Pepe, is not a Nazi. He has been consistently and outspokenly appalled by what's happened to his creation. He has sued several prominent alt-right figures, including Alex Jones, for copyright infringement because they have been profiting, selling mm -hmm, his work, yep. profiting off of it. 
uh, and he was sufficiently disgusted with the whole thing that he actually killed off Pepe in fiction. To further muddy the waters, Pepe has recently been associated with the Hong Kong protests. Most people outside of North America do not perceive Pepe the Frog to be connected with right-wing ideology, and divorced from the context of white supremacist authoritarianism, in Hong Kong, Pepe has become a symbol of youthful participation in the anti-authoritarian progressive movement. Hmm, that's hard. To quote Ben Goldacre, I think you'll find it's more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> always is. Thank you, Jim. You're I welcome. appreciate you diving down into that slime pit so I didn't have to go back in. <laughs> <laughs> I modeled myself very much after my generation's detached anger and sardonic behavior, and I'm learning to get myself out of it now because this is the eventual response is things like kekism. So I'm trying really hard not to be sardonic. Not that <laughs> anyone cares, but this is my podcast episode. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for that disgusting dive through the dark belly of the internet for some more palatable internet content. <laughs> Ashlyn, can we have some pasta? Many atheists are familiar with pastafarianism, or the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, uh, as it is alternatively known. Uh, pastafarianism is, of course, a portmanteau of pasta and rastafarianism. This is only one of several problematic things about pastafarianism, but it is, in general, a pretty lighthearted and fun new religion. Yeah. Uh, it started as a protest against teaching creationism in schools. In 2005, there were a lot more battles around that topic than there are currently. And a young physics student named Bobby Henderson sent a letter to a school board that basically said, there is exactly as much evidence for creationism by the Christian God as there is uh, for creationism by the Flying Spaghetti Monster. And so I demand that you teach it with equal time as you teach creationism by the Christian God. And I expect this to happen immediately. They, of course, did not comply. <laughs> <laughs> this was not taken seriously. Why not? <laughs> I'm still waiting for, you know, a teapot in the sky to be taught. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So he posted his letter on the internet. Part of it was, I fully expect then that this FSM theory will be admitted into accepted science with a minimum of apparently unnecessary bureaucratic nonsense, including the peer review process. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the letter went quite viral. People were very into this idea. Uh, and pretty quickly, he had several companies vying to publish a book on the Flying Spaghetti Monster. <laughs> so he wrote a book because, you know, you got people wanting you to write a book about your fake religion. Why not? Because the Internet was a mistake. <laughs> when I was in, uh, I think, eighth grade or ninth grade, I had a Geocities page uh, dedicated to the Church of Wallism. <laughs> what were your tenets? I don't remember. All in all, it's just another brick. Always honor the wall or something. Yeah, the wall like supports or something. you. Something about drywall. You were what, like an archbishop or something? No, I, I, no, I was the patron saint, saint of, of insulation. insulation. That's right. All of your email addresses had to do with wallism for a long time. I wish I was joking. Well, but, oh my okay. god! How did you not cover this religion? <laughs> It is. It's, so, well, first of all, like GeoCities has not been up for a long time. Yeah. Uh, R.I.P. those dolls. Lots of people uh, have things that they are embarrassed about in their <laughs> in their past that are enshrined in their email addresses, I, yep. I'm sure. Yep. <laughs> Remind me someday to tell you what the GeoCities page I created for the Rampaging Platypus Armada. <laughs> <laughs> So Bobby Henderson uh, accepted an $80,000 advance to write the Gospel of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, uh, and it took off from there. I remember uh, seeing the pre-orders for this book and being pretty excited about it. I still have not read it. <laughs> <laughs> I considered downloading it and reading it today, but I did not. <laughs> have you thought about Discordianism, honey? You sound like you'd fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> so the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster has sort of all of the basics of your average religion. They have a creation story. They have ways that they recommend that you worship. They have the eight, I really rather you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a lot of the problematic aspects of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster come from the fact that it was basically created by the New Atheist Movement in 2005. And yeah. all of the crappy things about that community are uh, reflected 
in this church. In Flying Spaghetti Monster Heaven, there are uh, there is a stripper factory and a beer volcano. <laughs> <laughs> Look on Jem's face. <laughs> Fac- factory, eh? Yes. Yeah. They're just churned out because they're definitely not people. Yeah, definitely not people. Uh, so the basic creation myth, the flying spaghetti monster who is invisible and undetectable. That's a very important part of the religion, that he cannot be detected or they cannot be detected in any way. Uh, so don't bother looking for his noodliness because you will not find him. <laughs> But the only good pasta is detectable pasta that I can go, ooh, can I have some of that? (laughs) He created the universe after drinking heavily. Uh, The monster's intoxication is why the earth is flawed. So there is an explanation for why nothing is perfect, which many other religions lack an explanation for that, really. Well, they don't really. They just blame humans. They say God made it amazing and you humans screwed screwed it up. up. (laughs) Yeah. All evidence for evolution was planted by the flying spaghetti monster in an effort to test the faith of the pastafarians. This is also true of any evidence that contradicts the creation myth or any of its tenets. Uh, Very important that the pastafarians faith be tested over and over and over again. And this is of course a direct parody of like literal creationists. Yeah. Uh, They're very much like the dinosaur bones were planted. Uh, Yeah. A wizard did it. Yeah. Whatever. (laughs) The wizard was God. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) God loves us so much, but doesn't trust us one inch. (laughs) Would you? (laughs) So he created the land and the earth, but he had to create the earth twice because he forgot he did it the first time. Um, (laughs) Okay. uh, And then they have a flood, just like the Christian Bible. uh, And that is explained as a cooking accident. (laughs) (laughs) The pasta boiled over. The pasta boiled over. (laughs) (laughs) So, oh. This is so bad. So I've described heaven as having a beer factory and a stripper factory. Sorry, beer volcano and a stripper factory. Uh, The Pastafarian hell is similar, except the beer is stale and the strippers have STIs. Oh, Mm. God. Yeah, yeah. There's some problems. (sighs) Uh, So a big part of Pastafarianism uh, is pirates. So according to Pastafarian beliefs, pirates are absolute divine beings and the original Pastafarians. The concept of pirates as thieves and outcasts is, according to Pastafarians, misinformation spread by Christian theologians in the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> they were, according to Pastafarians, I've said that were too many times today already, uh, <laughs> believed that they were peace-loving explorers and spreaders of goodwill who distributed candy to small children. <laughs> oh, wait, those were privateers. Eh. Uh, so... The pirate thing was part of the original letter that Bobby Henderson sent to the Board of Education, and it just sort of kind of grew weirdly from there. (laughs) Uh, Because, like, pirates don't really have anything to do with pasta. No, but he had chapters to fill. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It is funny. I just recently watched a video of uh, a video games journalist, I think this was last year, discovering what pirates were. They were previewing a pirate game. Mm-hmm. And he didn't know that pirates stole things. What? I guess he just thought it was an aesthetic. Oh my god! Oh, it is really very funny. <laughs> like, yeah, they're just like sailors and stuff, right? But they had they like like drinking and have swords. <laughs> what do you think the swords were used for? <laughs> Fending off the good guys. Oh, that's why it's called piracy. <laughs> That's so funny. This was a man like my age. <laughs> oh, Apparently no. he lived a sheltered life. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a weird thing to not learn. Everyone is allowed to learn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Some people do it live on the air. <laughs> uh, so pirates ended up in the religion due to uh, Bobby trying to explain the difference between correlation and causation. Uh, and that they're not related. Uh, So he did this by including in his letter a mislabeled graph uh, implying that global warming, earthquakes, hurricanes, and other natural disasters are a direct effect of the shrinking number of pirates since the 1800s. (laughs) (laughs) So pirates go down, bad things go up. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Important pieces of the religion. Uh, Prayers are concluded with the final declaration of Raman. Oh, that man. makes sense. Bless, bless the R. Yeah. Noodles. Yeah. Ah, noodles. 
Oh, I'm not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Um, around the time of Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, etc., Pastafarians celebrate holiday. <laughs> it's just called holiday. Uh, it does not take place on a specific date so much as it is the holiday season itself. Um, much like candle nights, you know, mm-hmm. it, uh, it's around then. Good things happen. What's candle it's nights? McElroy. Yeah, another oh. very famous podcast uh, group that celebrates an undefined holiday season that starts around when the holidays start and end kind of in January. <laughs> okay. Bold of you to assume that it's another highly famous podcast. Thank you for going We are the in. most famous podcast, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> <laughs> we have almost 1,000 listeners. <laughs> well, it's familiar, but not too familiar. <laughs> So you might think that this entire religion sounds extremely fake, and you would probably be right. But it has been recognized uh, with legal status in several countries. Mm -hmm. uh, Because they have beliefs, and they can show that they had have adherence. And in a lot of places, that's all you need. To get tax-free status. Yeah. One of the more interesting things that has gotten into, I guess, the culture surrounding pastafarianism is the practice of wearing colanders on your head, it's like a, a pasta strainer <laughs> yep, on your right. head as religious headgear. And this has been used to protest like exceptions to things or to protest things like the Quebec law. So there have been people who have fought to be allowed to wear a colander on their head for their driver's license, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. stuff like that, because it is a religion. And so you need to allow me to wear my religious headgear. Interestingly, the colander does not appear anywhere in the Gospel of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. This is just something that somebody else made up and started doing. uh, And it sort of spread to the rest of the Pastafarianism movement. The Um, Gospel according to (laughs) Call. In response, Bobby Henderson has said, I'd love to tell you that our traditions are all planned, but much of it just happens and either it sticks or it doesn't, like spaghetti. (laughs) You can see that religious headgear uh, with the colander thing um, sort of as a protest against the idea of religious exemptions for headgear, because clearly the the implication is that, you know, you shouldn't be allowed to wear a pasta strainer on your head if you're a police officer or for your driver's license photo, just as the implication is you shouldn't be allowed to wear a turban, um, which uh, I think is not a good thing to fight for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Because believe it or not, like sincerity of belief matters. Yeah. You know, (laughs) it's okay to to, like care about things. I'm learning this. Yeah. I am. (laughs) I am undoing a lot of unlearning of that. Mm hmm. The Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is one of those places, especially in the U.S., where you can get ordained to do weddings for basically nothing. Uh, So that's fun. You can (laughs) uh, marry your friends with credentials from the Flying Spaghetti Monster Church. Probably wouldn't pass muster in Canada. No, No, it doesn't. It's very much more strict up here. Thanks, Jim, for performing our wedding yet again. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to finish with a reading of the eight I'd really rather you didn't. Uh, <laughs> they're pretty funny. And they really show sort of why this parody religion was created and what they really want out of it. So originally, the Flying Spaghetti Monster gave uh, Captain Mosey, I think it was, uh, 10 tablets of advice. He, uh, did he and drop he some? dropped a couple yeah. of them on the way <laughs> down the the mountain, the Mount Salsa, I believe it is. <laughs> uh, and so this uh, has led to the flimsy moral beliefs of pastafarianism. Hmm. According to the book. <laughs> okay, number one, I'd really rather you didn't act like a sanctimonious holier than thou ass when describing my noodle goodness. If some people don't believe in me, that's okay. Really, I'm not that vain. Besides, this isn't about them, so don't change the subject. I'd really rather you didn't get an editor. Uh, Also, all of these letters are capitalized because they're commandments. Or I'd really rather you didn't. That is exhausting. (laughs) (laughs) Number two. I'd really rather you didn't use my existence as a means to oppress, subjugate, punish, eviscerate, and or, you know, be mean to others. I don't require sacrifices and purity is for drinking water, not people. I'd really rather you didn't judge people for the way they look or how they dress or the way they talk or, well, just play nice, okay? Oh, and get this in your thick heads. Women equal person. Man equal person. Samey equal samey. One is not better than the other unless we're talking about fashion. And I'm sorry, but I gave that to women and some guys who know the difference between teal and fuchsia. Yet still there's stripper <laughs> factories and uh-huh. shaming for STIs. Yep. Okay. They had some places to grow in this religion. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Contains multitudes. <laughs> Purity is for drinking water, I guess. <laughs> Number four. I'd really rather you didn't indulge in conduct that offends yourself or your willing consenting partner of legal age and mental maturity. As for anyone who might object, I think the expression is go fuck yourself, unless they find that offensive, in which case they can turn off the TV for once and go for a walk for a change. <laughs> <laughs> Number five. I'd really rather you didn't challenge the bigoted, misogynist, hateful ideas of others on an empty stomach. Eat, then go after the bullshit. <laughs> Important. <laughs> Number six. I'd really rather you didn't build multi-million dollar churches slash temples slash mosques slash shrines to my noodly goodness when the money could be better spent. Take your pick. Ending poverty, curing diseases, living in peace, loving with passion, and lowering the cost of cable. <laughs> I might be a complex carbohydrate omniscient being, but I enjoy the simple things in life. I ought to know I am the creator. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven. I'd really rather you didn't go around telling people I talk to you. You're not that interesting. Get over yourself. <laughs> and I told you to love your fellow man. Can't you take a hint? And number eight. I'd really rather you didn't do unto others as you would have them do unto you if you are into, um, stuff that uses a lot of leather slash lubricant slash Las Vegas. If the other person is into it, however, pursuant to number four, then have at it, take pictures, and for the love of Mike, wear a condom. Honestly, it's a piece of rubber. If I didn't want it to feel good when you did it, I would have added spikes or something. <laughs> And those are the I'd really rather you didn't of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Okay. okay. And I mean, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is still being used much like uh, the Church of Satanism to challenge laws oh. that are based on religions that are bad laws. Mm -hmm. So in that vein, I support their work. Mm -hmm. But they have some theological growing to do. Yes. <laughs> and that's okay. So do we all. So say we all. So say so we say all. We all. Yeah, that one. What's that show called again? Battlestar Battle Galactica. Galactica. I was gonna say Babylon Five. I'm like, I know that's not right, but I can't remember the yeah. other name. Oh my At least god! It's easy to get them mixed up because they're like. I've, well, I've only seen the Battlestar. Oh, okay. I watched You've somehow seen an episode or two. Could of. be anyway, but I did recognize that one. I'm just yeah. couldn't remember. <laughs> Thank you all for your deep dives into religion. <laughs> After the pasta, let's go with a little dessert of what are you enjoying lately? <laughs> Jim? Oh, I've got a list. <laughs> so I finally finished uh, reading Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism. and uh, That sounds like a fun jaunt. It, it was. It was pithy, you know, relatively speaking. It was, uh, it was pretty good. Uh, like, I feel like he... I, I am uh, quite a concrete person. And it was um, fairly jargony. I mean, it was, you know, like not as jargony as academic writing can be, but um, I would have appreciated some more like concrete uh, illustrations and examples. It, like, everything just kind of, I don't know, it was kind of, I don't know, it, it was fine. It was fine. I enjoyed it. Um, and at the moment, I'm also rather enjoying uh, Doing Right, a practical guide to medical ethics, mm -hmm. uh, especially the, yeah. the part where the authors recommend breaking the law if it is an un unjust law. Good. Unethical law. Uh, important for doctors to uh, remember. I have also been playing video games again now that my uh, multi-mini interviews are over. And I actually spent some time writing something that is basically uh, Goodreads, but for video games. Nice. Um, which is uh, good. Um, I just played Hex Cells, which is an excellent puzzle game uh, that's available on Steam for like two, two, three bucks or something. Highly recommended. It's kind of like Minesweeper if Minesweeper were good. <laughs> uh, I've I played uh, that. Yeah, it's good. Uh, it's, oh, the music is just so pleasant, too. Uh, I thought uh, Eliza was great. Uh, I finished uh, My Brother Rabbit and Kentucky Route Zero. So lots of... Um, oh, yeah, and uh, Eliza's solitaire game deserves a shout-out in its own right because it is worth the price of admission all on its own. Anyway, uh, if, if you like games, check those out. Very good. cool. Ashlyn, what are you enjoying? I am currently reading a book called Murder Most Florid about a forensic botanist. Uh, it's not about a forensic. It was written by a forensic botanist uh, about, so far, his methods and random observations that he <laughs> has about his colleagues and things he finds in the field. And he talks a lot about brambles. He's uh, <laughs> British and gay, and it's 
written in a very British style, like almost Douglas Adamsy. Like he'll be talking about the scientific names of brambles and then go off on a thing about uh, how blackberries are delicious, which I did not know until now that brambles were blackberries. Bramble bushes is where blackberries grow. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. I feel like I've heard that that link yeah. before. Yeah, it's really fun so far, and I like it. Cool. That sounds really fun. Laura? Yeah, I am enjoying a show that we're watching right now. It's called Catastrophe. Oh, it's, it's so good. It's really excellent. It uh, The writing is excellent. The situation is good. Uh, it was so good. It's uh, it's really worth a watch. It's it's great. Really, really enjoying that. It's uh, it's only twenty four episodes long. Uh, four four British seasons. Yeah, I was gonna say, so, the longest running British show ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but it's 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 worth a watch. It's it's really fun. As for reading, I'm actually really enjoying. I signed up for a newsletter of sorts. It's called Gastro Obscura, which is part of nice. the Atlas Obscura. Yeah. So it combines my favorite nonfiction and food. So I love it. So um, yeah, definitely I would check that out. There's been a lot of really cool stuff. That's where I found out about uh, that sandwich that would be served during Prohibition times in order yeah. to serve alcohol with awesome. it. Awesome. And then I'm finally have been getting around to reading intuitive eating. I've read all the peripheral things, but I'm finally kind of checking my way through the book right now. Awesome. I uh, used to get Atlas Obscura in my RSS feeds until Google murdered Google Reader. I'm still mad about it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, It was actually in my time hop like today or yesterday about me yelling about them getting rid of Google Reader. And I'm still not over. I think it was like 2016. Ugh. (laughs) <laughs> the wound is still fresh. So I actually... I, th- I think it was actually older than that. I don't know. Like before that. I logged into my replacement feed reader that I got after they murdered Google Reader to see if there was still anything in there. Uh, and there was two web comics that I used to follow are still publishing. And that's the only thing that is still publishing <laughs> oh. to my feed. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, like maybe some of the A other ones just moved, moved their feeds. Right. Yeah. So I'm enjoying a couple of things, surprisingly. I've just finished, as in on the bus ride home today, H.H. Holmes, The True History of the White City Devil by Adam Selzer. Far be it from the tales of H.H. Holmes setting up a hotel to murder hundreds of people during the uh, Chicago exhibition, he probably only killed about 10 people and they were all because of money reasons. Hmm. And it's really good and it, it does a pretty deep dive. I am also enjoying, well, Ashlyn and I just finished both seasons of Fleabag. Oh, I've heard that's really good. With, yeah, we thought it was going to be funny and light. and You it's... might have thought that. I knew. <laughs> I thought it was going to be funny and light. And it has a lot of surprising emotional depth. And it made me cry a little bit. That's like nice. catastrophe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, very much so. And finally, on a personal note, I am enjoying my social media secular Lent. <laughs> this is the first time I'm doing any sort of Lent, and it's not because of my church or anything. It's just something I wanted to do. I've been off Twitter. I've been off Facebook. Those were basically the only two I used. And I have so much free time, I could read a book on the bus. <laughs> the only thing I miss is some memes, but Ashlyn's got me covered there. So I'm really enjoying that. Nice. That's great. That's a hard thing to do. Mm-hmm. to separate yourself like that and to, I had to to stick with it. I had to delete Twitter off my phone. And I only leave Facebook up for things that I do where I'm m- administrating. Representative. Yeah, administrating right. some things that are Facebook specific. And I, I've i buried it in a folder on my phone with a bunch of really crappy games that I don't play. <laughs> so it's just <laughs> stuck on the back page. I never put anything on the back page. But it's just stuck on the second page of my phone and I only go into it when I need it. Nice. Good for you. Keep it up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thinking of not going back to Twitter. I don't know. It's bad for you. I know. Yep. For the amount of up-to-date information that you might get, it's such a time sink. If I go back, I'm going to curate my list. A lot of who I was following on Twitter specifically were historians for some of the the, uh, historical amateur research I do. So Mm -hmm. that I'd keep, but some of the news stuff I'd get rid of. What are we talking about next month, Ashlyn? I don't know. <laughs> we'll okay. figure it out. We'll figure it out. It'll, It'll be, be a surprise. surprise. So now we all know why we don't let the Discordian host the podcast very often. 
The Discordian did just fine. Thank you for hosting and <laughs> pulling us all together. Thank you all for joining me. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. And thanks for your five-star reviews. Life, the Universe, and Everything Else is produced by Jem Newman and Ashlyn Noble, with mix and tech production by Jem Newman. If you want to support the show, the best way to do that is with a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, or by sharing an episode with a friend. Original music is produced by Ian James, and this episode was edited by Laura Creek Newman. This is Spadercast. I don't know, sea lion. Everybody, uh, just try to be a little bit careful with your lips. Probably need some water. Laura will. Laura will enjoy editing this. Outtake. Hey, I heard you loud and clear. Your More funeral. lips. <laughs> <laughs> and God said, "Let there be lips," and there were, and it was good. Ne- Never-ending pastafarian bowl. Uh, Excellent joke fake laugh. Out of somebody else's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Cats are so annoying. What are we talking about next month, Ashlyn? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, kill your idols. I don't know what I would do for that. It's a fun one, though. No, that would be really depressing, probably, actually. Always look on the bright side of life.